February 1744. The Russian crown is a dangerous prize, hard to claim, harder still to keep. No one knows this better than the reigning empress of Russia, Elizabeth Petrovna Romanova. Elizabeth rules over a vast empire, home to a handful of the richest people on earth. Only five years before, the court was in chaos. The largest empire on earth was ruled by an infant. After the death of Peter the Great, rival factions wrestled for supremacy for 15 years. In 1740, the crown landed on the most unlikely head of all, Ivan VI, a baby not even one year old. In St. Petersburg, the Russian capital, the muscle that mattered was the Imperial Guard. No one took the throne or sat on it for long without armed backing from the all-powerful guards. Barely 12 months after baby Ivan was crowned, Elizabeth Petrovna, the daughter of Peter the Great, rallied the Imperial Guard. She ordered her troops to lock up the infant emperor, her own cousin, and grabbed the throne for herself. Ivan VI will spend his days in prison, cut off from contact with the rest of the world. His fate offers a lesson on the danger of the Russian throne. A lesson even his jailer, the new Empress Elizabeth, takes to heart. For most of his life, Ivan has been a prisoner, growing up in isolation. His existence essentially erased, the guards refer to him only as nameless prisoner number one. He has no education, and he grows up to be a sort of idiot, uneducated, no one's really talked to him, he's only seen the inside of this cell, but weirdly he knows that he's an emperor. In 1756, Ivan receives a visitor, the Empress Elizabeth. The Empress knows that if her prisoner were to win supporters, it would threaten her reign and possibly her life. Fifteen years after deposing him, Elizabeth needs to know if the boy harbors any ambition for the crown. This was partly a fascination with this young freak imprisoned in his cell. One meeting is enough to convince the Empress that Ivan poses no threat to her reign. Secure on her throne, she's free to focus on enemies outside the Empire. In Europe, the ambitious King of Prussia, Frederick the Great, launches a crusade to seize Poland for his new German Empire threatening Russia's regional dominance. Elizabeth sends 43,000 men to crush Frederick's imperial ambition and to carve out new territory for her empire. Elizabeth throws a succession of elaborate parties while hundreds of soldiers die for Russia. From the Empress, Catherine learns the ruthless strategies for building empire. But her husband, Peter, is not rooting for the Russians. Peter idolizes Russia's enemy, Prussia, and its Germanic king, Frederick. Peter models his military ideals, even his clothing, on the German model. His passion for all things German reduces his standing at court from nuisance to near traitor. Among those who scorn the Grand Duke Peter are two veterans of the ongoing war, the Orloff brothers, the scar-faced Alexei, 
and his older brother Grigory, a commander in the Russian army. Grigory Orlov's bravery is legendary. At the Battle of Zorndorf, he is wounded three times and yet continues to lead the fight. His heroics win Orlov total devotion from the Imperial Guard and make him the center of attention in the salons of St. Petersburg. The celebrated warrior makes a strong contrast to Catherine's juvenile, German-loving husband. The Imperial Guard have the power to determine who sits on the Russian throne. Grigory Orlov's hold over them and his good looks prove an irresistible combination for the Grand Duchess. In Orlov, Catherine takes more than a lover. She lays the foundation for her own power base. She knows that she needs to build alliances, that she is, in a sense, left out in the wind, hanging a bit, given the relationship that is deteriorating between her and her husband. September 20th, 1754. Empress Elizabeth Petrovna, the daughter of Peter the Great, has reason to celebrate. She finally has an heir to the throne. Catherine had come from a distant German state, married into the Romanov dynasty, and made herself a Russian. Now, after nine years of marriage and two miscarriages, Catherine finishes the job she was picked for. She delivers an heir to the Russian throne, a healthy boy, the Grand Duke Paul. The Empress Elizabeth promptly claims her prize and leaves with it. Elizabeth plans to raise the boy as her own. For the elite few, the empire's wealthy nobles, war is a time for celebration. But for the impoverished Russian people, there is only despair. The empress may declare war, but it's the poor who do the fighting and dying for her empire. Peasants are drafted into military service, and among them is one group especially prized by the army. The Cossacks, the legendary horsemen of the Russian South. Elizabeth's army conscripts many in the Cossack regions in the South. One Cossack drummed into service and away from his wife is the 18-year-old Emilian Pugachev. <laughs> The army transforms men like Pugachev from proud and free horsemen into military slaves. His first war wounds come at the orders of his own commander. He is flogged for failing to prevent the theft of a horse. All across Russia, brutal treatment fuels the rage of the peasants. Soon, Emilian Pugachev will channel the people's wrath into an assault that will undermine the very foundations of the empire. At the front lines, the war rages on. By December of 1761, the Prussians struggle to hold the outskirts of Berlin. With the Russians poised to destroy his empire, King Frederick considers suicide. But in St. Petersburg, the 52-year-old Russian Empress also faces death. After a lifetime of excess, Elizabeth has collapsed. Her nephew, the Grand Duke Peter, still idolizes Russia's enemy, the Prussian King Frederick. And Peter is still heir to Elizabeth's throne. The new Empress Tsar Peter III. Soon after taking the throne, Peter rolls back the gains from six years of war. 
Russian troops have Prussia and Frederick the Great on the verge of defeat. But Peter calls a truce. He offers Russia's enemies generous peace terms. He even returns conquered territory. One of the first things Peter III does is to call off the war, which sends shockwaves throughout the army. Peter's ill-conceived peace with Prussia rescues his hero, Frederick the Great, from the brink of annihilation. It also wipes out any support Russia's new czar might expect from his own military. Peter's truce with Prussia shocks the Russian nobility. But fighting men at the front welcome the release from the death sentence of war. For peasants across Russia, a new czar signals a flicker of hope. Peter III just might be the savior who will ease the burdens of serfdom. But for noble Russian patriots, Peter's peace treaty smacks of treason. The move infuriates even those closest to the czar, including Grigory Orlov and his brother, the captain of the palace guard, Alexei. Peter insults the imperial guards by changing their uniforms from Russian green to Prussian blue. The childish Emperor Peter even manages to take a mistress, parading her openly at court and driving a wedge between himself and Catherine. In Peter's mind, Catherine is disposable. But what he doesn't know is that his own guards the Orlov brothers are on Catherine's side. Grigory Orlov and his brothers were crucial for Catherine's safety as things went on and her relationship with her husband so rapidly deteriorated. As Peter III offended every single part of Russian society that mattered, he was absolutely loathed. At a party in June, Peter lets his tongue slip. Dora! He publicly calls his wife a fool. The Orlovs take it as a sign that the Tsar plans to dispose of Catherine. June 21st, 1762. Peter's police arrest one of Orlov's collaborators. Alexei Orlov rides out to Catherine's estate to warn her that their cover could be blown. Throwing off Tsar Peter's Prussian blue uniforms, the guardsmen rally to Catherine's side. Catherine herself suits up in military regalia and prepares to seize the Russian crown. The Orlovs direct the Imperial Guard to escort Catherine into the palace and install her on the throne. At one barracks, a brash young officer steps forward to present Catherine a gift. Grigory Alexandrovich Potemkin. Catherine will remember Potemkin's gallant devotion long after she rides off to St. Petersburg to reach for the throne. And so will the Orlovs. With Peter occupied outside the capital, Catherine sweeps into the palace. St. Petersburg's nobility flock to join the coup. At Kazan Cathedral, Russia's elite proclaim Catherine the new Empress of Russia. The success of the coup leaves Catherine and her co-conspirators heady with triumph. For days, the new empress revels, exclaiming, such a huge and powerful empire as mine. But a shadow hangs over her stolen throne, the shadow of her husband, Peter, Russia's rightful emperor. In the wake of the coup, Peter is left in a suburban palace awaiting his fate. After surrendering his throne, all Peter hopes is to return to his German homeland in peace. July 5th. Locked away in an isolated palace, 
the former Tsar Peter consoles himself with his violin. He then receives some unexpected visitors, led by Alexei Orlov. <laughs> send a message to Catherine that the monster is dead. The traitorous czar is dead. <laughs> 